alcohol basically interferes with the way your body makes energy. Um, uh, when you're breaking down alcohol, um, basically your liver doesn't produce as much glucose. Uh, without being kind of overly technical, um, which means you end up having low blood sugar. Uh, basically, affects uh, affects how you create your energy and how you how you perform. Uh, co- coordination, right. dexterity, things like that, all gets affected by that. Welcome to Forever Young, the health podcast from Lanzerhof. My name is Nils Behrens, and I'm not looking for eternal use. I'm trying to find answers to what leading a healthy life really means. Therefore, I will be talking to various health experts to find out what you can do to stay fit for as long as possible. And who knows, perhaps this knowledge will help lead you to a longer life after all. Welcome to Forever Young. This is our second episode, this time with Jason Reynolds. Jason Reynolds is our chief sports scientist at Lanzerhof at the Arts Club in London. At the moment, he is also training from home like everybody, and um, he, our followers on Instagram can watching him. But not only them, his giraffe, Bert, is always <laughs> present when he is doing Pilates or um, other workouts. And yeah, welcome, Jason. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me, Nils. Uh, yeah, it's good. I'm looking forward to uh, getting some more information out there. And uh, yeah, it's been interesting uh, going through these live classes, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, it's a new experience, for sure. So Especially because you can't see the audience. Yeah, it, it definitely requires a, a slightly different uh, way of teaching. Um, usually, you obviously can be a little bit reactive to people's positions and, and their feedback. This is obviously a little bit less feedback, so you're trying to give information that covers a whole range of uh, people's experience in terms of where they are positionally and also what they're feeling during the exercise. So I, I'm probably talking more than I normally do as well, really trying to cover all those bases as well. So uh, it's, been, it's been fun. It's a good, uh, good lesson. I have my first question. My first question is why it is important to keep our bodies moving during this on certain times. Is it, uh, is it um, different than in normal times? Yeah, I, look, I think obviously we're, we're by government guidelines we're a little bit penned into the idea of how much activity we're doing, especially if people are still working from home. Um, so, you know, uh, what people do in their commute, uh, what people might do walking around the office, going for lunch, uh, and just in their general daily activities, um, is has been something that's people get into really usual habits. Um, what we've done now is we're taking those habits and changing it. Um, so people are becoming a lot more sedentary. Um, people are doing many, many less steps per day. Um, and generally, you know, the amount of resistance training, uh, the amount of res- resisted exercise in general um, has become less and less. And that's obviously a very important um, factor for while people are doing this home working while we are a little bit uh, resisted in um, you know, what, what we're able to do. Um, I think, you know, uh, being sedentary, there's lots of obviously... You know, health markers that come with that, but, you know, obesity, diabetes, high cholesterol, stuff like that comes from those, that lack of exercise. So it's important, you know, for us to keep moving. Um, you know, your heart ultimately is a muscle. So again, less work it does, the weaker it becomes. So we want to keep it strong. Um, but also, you know, within our muscles, you know, uh, we have cells in our muscles called myokines, which are basically the cells will help us regulate our body function. Um, so we have less muscle. We have, um, less control of our bodily functions and our uh, way our hormones function, things like that. So less muscle, we actually become more susceptible to getting viruses and infections. So, um, yeah, we need to keep moving. We need to keep strong. That's, uh, that's really important during these times. All right. Thank you. Concerning the day, or let, let's say when you are in the home office, you are a little bit more flexible concerning your time because normally you don't have so many meetings, normally you don't have have a lunch break or something like that. So uh, probably you are a little bit more flexible in choosing your time. So what would you recommend? What is the be- or When is the best time of the day to work out? And again, yeah, you're completely right. People are more flexible now. It used to be, you know, people, if they started work at a certain time or finished at a certain time, then they would be able to work out in the morning or in the evening or perhaps on their lunch breaks. And it'd be very, very regimented. Now we have a little bit more flexibility. Um, and ultimately that comes down to people's individual, uh, preferences. Some people, uh, some people are morning people. Some people, uh, some people want to stay in bed for as long as they can. Um, so, you know, that, that can be, you know, there's no negative in that. 
Um, you've got to find a time that works for you. Again, if you have a job that's uh, physically demanding, um, you know, if you're you know, stressful during the day, then actually training in the evening after that might be might be quite limiting. Um, you might find you get less out of it, but perhaps doing something more uh, spiritual and something that more sort of stress relieving in the evening can, can be preferential as well. So it, it is very, very individual and you just have to find what works for you. Um, in terms of our physical performance um, and the way our body works, sometimes you know, our body's circadian rhythms um, do influence our sporting performance. Um, you know, if you wanted to go and set a world record or if you looked at all the history of when world records were set, for instance, um, they are set in the afternoons. They're not set in the morning. So generally our bodies do take a little while to get up to a, a, a sort of a optimal function. Um, but again, we're not, you know, we're not all world-class athletes. We're not all trying to set world records. We're just trying to work what, you know, what's best for us. So, um, I think that's important to, to trial and error a little bit as well. And, you know, try a morning class, try an evening class, try a run at a certain time uh, and see what makes you feel the best. All right. I've learned that it is pretty hard to get any equipment now at the moment. So not only because the shops are closed, but also online uh, prices for dumbbells are very high or even uh, pretty hard to get at the moment. Um, do you really need equipment, workout equipment for your, your training at home? Um, I mean, the short answer is no, you don't really need equipment. And having equipment helps, like it gives you more options, I think is a good way to describe it. But if you don't have equipment, you, you know, your body weight um, and the items within, within someone's house um, are more than, more than enough for you to continue training during this period. Um, you know, obviously having uh, increased amounts of weight um, can, challenge, can make more challenging things, but also doing more, more repetitions of body weight exercise can, can be your challenge as well. Um, I think one of the preferences that I have as a trainer for people when they're doing body weight stuff is using that, that time and that, that body weight movement to, um, actually increase what we call proprioception and that's sort of the, the learning of how your body moves without any, without any resistance. Um, so be, being able to squat and keep your knee position perfect, being able to do arm movements overhead without your shoulders hunching and actually learning and becoming really, really good at doing those movements um, is actually a good use of this time, I guess. So sometimes when people don't have, you know, aren't training at home, they are going to a gym, you're automatically going to pick up weight, you're automatically going to do difficult things because we want to work really, really hard. We always think that's the way to do it. As a trainer, more often than not, we're trying to slow people down and speed them up because people always want to jump and uh, kind of jump and end up running before they can walk. So, um, you know, we're kind of as trainers trying to nudge people at this time to become greater controlling your movement. And that makes training easier as we go ahead. I think it's very um, typical that the people are always a little bit over ambitious. Um, what would you say, how much physical activities do you recommend each week? Look, I think as per the government regulations, you know, usually, you, you know, get out the house and, you know, be active every day. Um, you know, don't, if you have a day where you don't leave your house for 24 hours, that's not a good thing. Uh, unless you live in a, in a palace where you're walking 10,000 steps from the East wing to the West <laughs> wing, um, then realistically you've got to get out. And that doesn't always necessarily mean you have to do something physically, um, demanding. It can be just going out for a walk, taking your hour and getting a good paced walk in, go find a park, find somewhere, obviously where you're social distancing, you're keeping, Uh, keeping safe, um, but go and you know go and go and explore a little bit. Um, you know, if you have any you know woodland areas near you, I'm, I'm lucky enough to live near Hampstead Heath, and that that's what I do. I go to the heath. I spend half an hour, 40 minutes walking around. It's pretty empty. It's great. It's fantastic. Um, in fact, actually, sometimes I try and take golf balls up there and hit them around when it's really empty. Uh, again, it keeps me it keeps me active. Um, and that's, that's you know you're finding something that gives you uh, you know a bit of a bit of joy and a bit of outside time. But that's something you can do every day. In terms of training, that's something that, again, is still a little bit individual. Um, look at what you did previously. If you trained you know, at the gym three times a week, then you've got to be doing at least three times a week at home. In fact, probably because you don't have resistance, you don't need as much recovery time. So you can go four times. You might even be able to go five times if they're, if they're short classes or not too challenging. Um, but I think ultimately you've got to learn about recovery as well. Um, usually as a trainer, if people are sore, I can direct them towards, you know, doing cryotherapy treatments, for instance, or massage or, you know, anything, you know, that might help them recover. Uh, if you don't have those options anymore, uh, it will be about you know, what you have uh, at home to recover. So it is about feeling it. You know, if you walk around and you feel sore, it's okay. It's good. You worked hard, but 
maybe allow yourself a day to recover. Just take a walk that day. The next day, go back to working hard. And use that soreness as a guide to knowing that you need to then just take a little bit of time to recover. Thank you very much. Uh, I have listened already to some of your presentations. And normally on your presentations, you are, I wouldn't say you are making jokes about this typical influencers making some fitness trainings and giving fitness advices. But at the end, you are a kind of person on Instagram giving fitness advices right now. Uh, right now, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Could you tell me, tell me where the difference is? Um. I, th I think it's always really important to understand where, where, when you're receiving information about training, where that information is coming from and who, who you're getting that information from. Um, if it's coming from someone online who is in quite good shape um, and doesn't happen to be a trainer, um, then look, I mean, take it with a pinch of salt. It's not necessarily to say that information is bad, but again, that's what works for them. And that's a very individual thing. And people are individual. You know, we're all different in the way that we get a response to exercise. So again, you're listening to trainers, not necessarily just you know people with with degrees. And obviously, having a sports science degree and that background uh, gives me a, done, a better understanding physiologically of different things. Uh, but trainers with really good experience, trainers with really good education in understanding what happens to the body. Um, you know, listening to someone just you know doing their classes or doing their workouts just because they're slim or just because they got big arms, it's not really. It's not, <laughs> I get the best way to describe it is it's it's what worked for them. Uh, and I guess in most cases, especially with social media, it's never quite as rosy as it looks. You know, it's always a little bit of a it's always a little bit of a best case scenario. So chances are, if you see someone getting big arms from doing a very gentle exercise, it's probably not how they got big arms. Um, so, again, try and get your advice or my opinion is to get advice from from those that have good educations, good experiences um, and, you know, can really explain in, in an individual way what you know, what you're trying to achieve. All right. So your training you can see on uh, Lanzerhof at the Arts Club. Uh, I think it's the, the name of the account, but we will also have it in the show notes. Um, let's maybe at the end wrap it down to what are your top five tips for keeping fit at home? Um, I, look, I think as, as, a, as a breakdown, num the number one thing to do is to, uh, is to create a routine. Um, you know, setting goals um, for for this for this process for this duration. If you haven't done so already, some people have done it. Obviously, we're you know we're almost six weeks into into lockdown now. So, um, you know, setting goals for this for this period is is a really helpful way of doing it. Um, there are on the Lansoft Instagram page there is some videos I did on goal setting and using a, an acronym called Clear, um, something we call Clear Goals, which are again a, a really good way of um, Setting, setting a process for you. And if you've never done that, again, go and, go and watch that video. Um, we'll make sure that's on the YouTube as well. Um, and again, it's just a good way to, to, to start the process because otherwise it's always a bit aimless and aimless doesn't really work. Uh, I think the second point would always be to try and make home exercise um, in, enjoyable uh, and quite inclusive. Uh, collaborative, I guess, is a good way to describe it. Um, you know, if, you, if you're at home with family, husband, wife, children... Uh, brothers, sisters, etc. You know, get them involved. Um, sometimes just being at home, you know, mentally, this is a really difficult period for everyone um, to stay to stay positive, to to keep on to our goals, and having other people there and having other people, uh, you know, be be you know, culpable and, and able to call us out if we're you know sitting in bed not doing anything. That that can help. So you know, try and get more people involved into it. Uh, I think. Probably my third point, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier as well, is, is don't underestimate the value of walking. Um, even from a pure calorie point of view, if we, you know, our, our base metabolic rate burns, say, 1,500 calories a day, maybe 1,000, 1,500 calories a day normally, um, we're changing that. We're doing less. So we need to make sure we are maintaining the levels that we were doing before. We want to try and keep our bodies working in that function. So... Uh, again, that's going to be a really good way of getting you up and out of bad positions as well, not sitting in chairs for too long um, and keeping you active. Um, uh, drinking water as well, staying hydrated. Uh, again, really key. People sitting at home, you know, people again, sometimes at desks, people keep a bottle there and they're in good habits. Again, out of that habit, you may find that you're not drinking as, uh, drinking as much water as normal. Um, This is what, so we, uh, what I idea. experience sometimes because normally uh, I have always some tea on my desk and uh, when I'm at home, I'm 
not sitting at a desk. And so I, I uh, totally agree. You, you have a, a different routine there. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a lot of what this is, is you're, you're trying to create new new routines. So it might be that by lunchtime you do that, you have a certain amount, um, you know, you have a certain amount to drink or you have a certain, you know, you, if you have a Barocca in the morning, make sure he's tired every day before 10 o'clock, you have a, uh, you know, uh, a Barocca or th those types of things or, you know, get into those habits. Um, and I think one of those important habits is, is sleep as well. That'd be probably my, my fifth tip is, is, is sleep. Um, now more than ever, we have a time where people can get their sleep right. Uh, more often than not, modern lives, getting up early for commutes, you know, getting home late, working late, gym, etc. cetera. Um, people's sleeps are terrible. And that's one of the things as a trainer that I end up having to try and, try and fix almost before we start is that if you don't have good sleep, you know, your responses to training is, is really limited, especially for females. You know, re it's really, really important for females. It's both male and female, but uh, men are lucky enough to have testosterone and that's kind of a, a get out of jail free card for a lot of hormonal functions from a male point of view. Obviously, females' testosterone levels are much, much lower. Um, so they rely on something called human growth hormone um, to help kind of repair of skin, uh, hair, nails, um, and also, again, kind of keep hormone function at a good level. Um, so, and for, you know, we produce that mostly whilst we sleep. Um, so if our sleep habits are poor, um, then the amount of human growth hormone we produce ends up being, being low and then we end up getting less out of it. We can't produce more, we can't, you know, we can't repair and rebuild muscle. We're not getting stronger bones, stronger tendons, things like that. So, um, yeah, that would definitely be my five points, create a routine, get more people involved, make sure you walk a lot, drink plenty of water and make sure you get use this time to get your sleep as perfect as possible. Excellent. Jason, one question you can see from the statistics that a lot of people are looking for additional trainings at homes, but on the same um, at the same time, you also see that the sale of alcohol is going up very high. So, Can you tell me something about this combination? When I'm, for example, having a workout, uh, probably in one of your classes, and afterwards I'm thirsty and drinking a beer or something like that, uh, what does it to my body? Um, yeah, completely right. Um, again, from a probably mental health point of view, people might turn to drinking for a bit of relaxation, which look, it happens. Um, Again, from a training point of view, however, unfortunately, it is uh, it is a bit of a negative. Um, obviously, I guess on the first point, alcohol, um, it, it is a diuretic. It is going to lead you to be dehydrated. Uh, you know, that's going to it's going to limit sporting performance. There's, uh, you know, plenty of sporting journals out there that kind of explain about um, you know, what hydration is and how important it is. And you're looking at anywhere, you know, a performance drop of anywhere sort of between sort of 10 and 40, you know, anywhere from 10 up to 40% uh, drop in, in performance values just from the level of dehydration. Um, so again, if you're drinking alcohol and you're getting dehydrated, um, you know, that, that's going to limit what you can do. And if you're, you know, if you're drinking the night before you train, it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect you in the morning because you're not going to be as hydrated. It's going to take you time. It's going to take a few hours for you to get rehydrated. So if you're training in the morning, definitely don't train, uh, sorry, definitely don't drink the night before. Um, and if, you know, if you're planning on training when you've been drinking, uh, that's definitely not a good idea either. Um, alcohol basically interferes with the way your body makes energy. Um, uh, when you're breaking down alcohol, um, basically your liver doesn't produce as much glucose uh, without being kind of overly technical, um, which means you end up having low blood sugar, Uh, basically affects uh, affects how you create your energy and how you how you perform. All right. Uh, co coordination, dexterity, things like that, all gets affected by that. So you can say at the end when you have uh, made some exercise, you can't say that this justify additional alcohol. No, no, no. Again, if you if you train and then you have a drink, all you're doing is is limiting the the positive impact the training will have. Um, You know, in, in terms, especially in terms of how how we how we're using, and you know, people are often doing it from a, I guess as, as a basic level, on a, as a calorie point of view. People people are training so they can have a drink, um, but that doesn't really work because if you have a drink, you're taking away the effect your training is having, and you're not really burning as many calories, and you're certainly not getting the response. So, um, my advice would be to around your training, not to drink. 
My last question is a personal uh, question. You see on Instagram so many trainers recommending burpees. And um, I have the feeling that <laughs> there's no workout in, in, in the internet uh, without burpees. Uh, could you tell me why are they are so popular? Well, first and foremost, there is one workout that doesn't have burpees, and that will always be my, my workout. <laughs> um, look, but, but <laughs> pure and simply, burpees are a really poor exercise. People use them, trainers will often prescribe them because it's a lot of movement and they're difficult. They are a tough thing to do. Um, it's a lot of function to do over and over and over again. And generally when they're taught, they're taught as sort of a high intensity exercise. And actually doing really, really complex movements in high intensity is really not the point. Um, that's, actually, that's actually not what high intensity interval training is necessarily about. Um, you want to do exercises that you can do well and keep good technique over and over and over again and challenge your physique in the right way, challenge your body in the right way. If you're doing complex movements over and over again, then all you're going to do is end up get to a point where you're going to do things badly. And that's really not the point. If we're, if we're doing burpees, generally you're doing them to get really, really tired. And there's just much better ways of doing it. You can just do push-ups or you can just do squats or you can just do jumping. You can all do even do all three. Just don't combine them together because you're just going to end up having a poor movement function, um, which isn't going to get you anything. You, you, you're much better off doing three separate exercises much, much better. You'll get more out of it. Um, and it kind of links back to the point I made earlier about where people are getting information from. Again, generally great, you know, good trainers, well-educated trainers are never going to prescribe them. You're generally going to see that from people that are perhaps have done it themselves. And yeah, look, it can work. You might get away with not getting injured. You, you will burn some calories. So yes, it can help. But for most people, there's just, there's just a lot better options out there. So, um, yeah, definitely a take home message from, from me is that please, you know, don't just do burpees because, someone who's slim did them try and think about doing good movements uh, and get educated about doing good movements over and over for sure thank you very much jason you're welcome what is the story of your giraffe um the story of, of Bert. um we me and my wife were in a in a zoo Oh, it must have been, I mean, probably maybe 10 years ago. Um, and they had this giant stuffed giraffe. It must have been, I don't know, 12 feet tall, huge giraffe. And we thought it'd be really awesome to have uh, in the house. Um, we went up and sort of looked at the price tag. And I think it was something like 3,000 pounds, which was a little crazy. Uh, I think if one agree, that's a little crazy. Um, so when we came back, we had a quick look online. Uh, went on Amazon, of course, you get everything on Amazon. And they had a, a slightly smaller stuffed giraffe. Um, so we bought, a, we bought that as well. Um, and it, it just breaks up the room, you know, it's just a nice, uh, a nice addition to the room. Thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed it, please leave me a review and subscribe to this podcast. Please stay healthy.